All right, so this is the second part of a discussion that I started last month, which was called Dharmas and the Perfection of Wisdom. So for those who weren't here for part one, or those who were, and it's been a month in between, <laughs> um, the, sort of the first presentation, we talked a lot about how dharmas <coughs> can be used to develop understanding of the conventional or mundane world through developing a, an apparatus that's seen as superior to our everyday ways of understanding experience. And we used examples from the Pali Suttas, uh, which included teachings like uh, the Satipatthana Sutra, which we use, which teaches the four foundations of mindfulness. So briefly, in a sutra like this, uh, the practitioner learns how to distinguish certain dharmas and separate them from the whole of experience. Next, the practitioner focuses on contemplative practices, using the dharmas as a sort of spiritual technology to develop insight into the subtle, veiled relationships between the entities of our experience. The end result is deep insight that frees the practitioner from the endless cycle of causation and suffering. Honestly, life seemed much simpler then. Our main concern was, as the Dhammapada puts it, not to do evil, to cultivate merit, to purify one's mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. This evening, we'll pick up with the transition from <coughs> wisdom via using the dharmas to analyze and understand to the perfection of wisdom via the elimination, deconstruction, destruction, recontextualization, or my personal favorite, reintegration of dharmas. But the idea is that we're fundamentally changing our understanding of what the dharmas are, right? First, we could say that learning to correctly identify dharmas and understand experience in terms of those dharmas is to cultivate wisdom. With the goal of following the bodhisattva path, we turn to a new possibility, the perfection of wisdom. To say that wisdom can be perfected implies that there is an end point to wisdom, a way to develop the wisdom already cultivated to such a degree that this wisdom would become complete or holistic. As was mentioned in the first part of this series, uh, Kanzi used the term gnosis in his paper on the Prajnaparamita text, and this choice conveyed the degree to which a perfected complete wisdom falls outside the messily defined containers of experience, mental concepts, physicality, or verbal designations. Amen. We're now talking about a wisdom that erases these boundaries and moves beyond them. We get a, glim a glimpse of the transformative power of perfect wisdom when Nagarjuna writes in the middle treatise that dharmas do not arise from themselves, and they do not arise from another, nor together, nor without causes. Therefore know that there is no substantial arising. Next slide, please. And again, I'm, I'm actually, uh, the okay. next slide has the quote on it. So you can, you can look at it while we're talking. It's this quote at the bottom. Dharmas do not arise from themselves, and they do not arise from another, nor together, <laughs> nor without causes. Therefore, knowing that there is no, know that there is no substantial arising. But this puts us in a position that is equal parts powerful and delicate. A position in which we must understand that the, dharma, the dharmas is not exclusively subjective or objective. They're not merely products of the mind or concepts, because they refer to objective phenomena. But objective phenomena likewise do not conform to our labeling of them. Our experience would then seem to be a combination of internal and external, subjective and objective entities in combination. But this must also be wrong because we cannot sufficiently establish subjective or objective dharmas in the first place. Much less can we accept without question the fourth option, that these entities are causally independent, immutable, always already arisen forms. Thus, Nagarjuna leaves us with the apparent paradox that there is no substantial arising of dharmas. In developing wisdom so far, we've torn apart a moment of experience through mental action, and then tried to project our fragmented understanding back onto the world and ourselves. Very soon, even the most unfamiliar experiences become familiar often to our detriment. We have, we've constructed a library of experience that no longer accepts new volumes and merely recombines the insights of the past. While there's a clear explanatory power derived from this constant recombination of things we already understand, in an important sense, our growth and understanding are limited by the comfort and ease we have begun to rely on. It is this insight that leads Nagarjuna to say in the dedication of the middle treatise that Shakyamuni Buddha taught, quote, the auspicious cessation of hypostatization. 
to help others awaken. And hypostatization is a synonym for reification or treating things that are concepts as if they are truly existing entities. <coughs> the perfection of wisdom texts can often be baffling because they interrogate the very foundations of the settled science of dharmic analysis. This is achieved through questioning the ontological status of dharmas, what the dharmas really are. For the sake of keeping things organized, I'm following Edward Kanzi's schema from his article, The Ontology of the Prajnaparamita, published in Philosophy East and West in July 1953. A particular strength of this article is that he provides examples from the text to explain the various viewpoints. We will look at a few ways the ontological status of dharmas is presented in Perfection of Wisdom texts, and then examine resultant psychological attitudes and implications with respect to logic. While not much time is spent on the soteriological aspects of perfect wisdom in the original article, after all, he was writing for a philosophy journal, it is important that we spend at least a little time trying to understand the purpose behind the content of the text. Next slide, please. Just explain what you mean by um, arising. A dharma arising? Yeah. So come into existence or? Yeah, so we're talking about through <coughs> through a causal process, a a dharma coming into existence from not having been there before, right? So there, there's a cause with a set of conditions, and that cause acting on the set of conditions gives rise to some sort of an effect, right? And this is the dharma in that case. You might want to give them the definition of what you're using as dharma. In this yeah, that's what I want to know. Okay. In that case, um, I did. I did mention in the in the handout. I just gave the brief explanation, uh, just saying phenomena. But to be more specific, um, one of the things that that we talked about a little bit in the first part was that understanding of what the dharmas are is sort of implicit. Not a lot of time is given to explaining exactly what a dharma is. So Kanzi listed three different ways that we could understand based on historical sources what people mean when they're referring to dharmas. And sort of one of the most common ones was, we're talking about an atomic unit of experience, as in... Atoms? A little different, but oh. it's... So when you're thinking about your experience, we're trying to analyze that experience into each part to such a degree that each of these parts only has one characteristic, right? And then we're going to use that to reanalyze the situation and understand how these things are sort of developed through causal processes, which that gives us insight in how causal processes work, which we use in contemplative practices to free ourselves from the endless cycle of rebirth through causation. And that's sort of the early poly version. Right? Can I ask something? No, at the, at the end. At the end. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. <clears throat> Is that? Good enough. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, one second. Oh yeah, oh yeah, so we were going on to the next slide. So, these are the sort of ways that Kanzi has categorized how the dharmas are talked about in Prajnaparamita texts. And this includes both sutra and shastra, which are commentaries on those texts, as well as treatises, which are philosophical texts about that same body of thought. <laughs> so, the first way that the dharmas are talked about in the Prajnaparamita is that the dharmas are talked about as being non-existent. So in the Prajnaparamita Sutra in 25,000 lines, which these are easy to keep track of because most of them are the Prajnaparamita Sutra in and then some number of lines, which makes things kind of confusing. <coughs> I'll try to keep us straight on that though. In the Prajnaparamita Sutra in 25,000 lines, we have the statement, what has no own being, that is non-existent. In other words, he's saying that things that uh, sort of arise through causation means that they're composed and so they don't have this sort of uh, eternal existence in an absolute sense. So we're not saying that the elements of our experience are unreal in that we don't experience them. We're saying that from a sort of holistic perspective, zooming out on this far enough, looking at it from the absolute, these things do not have existence in the sense that they are not ultimate facts. There's things that come and go. We may or may not remember from last time that own being, a translation of the term svabhava, refers to the status of being of an entity that does not arise from another entity. In this sense, we're talking about the notion of absolute existence. 
please, please, please remember that we are talking about absolute existence when we say that the dharmas are non-existent. This should not be misunderstood to say that the world, the people in it, and our experiences do not exist in a colloquial sense. Dharmas clearly have some level of existence, we're talking about them right now, which means they at least exist as concepts. We can understand this statement to mean that anything that arises through causation is temporary. By definition, there is a time before and after its existence as part of our experience. If the elements of our experience are understood to be dharmas, these dharmas must also be non-existent in the same sense, meaning that they are convenient constructions and not ultimate facts. Chandrakirti explains this view in his Prasanapada by saying, quote, Now this own being of entities, which is identical with non-production, is at the same time pure non-being, and that in the sense that it is not anything in particular. Therefore, the absolute own being is a negation of pluralistic own being. And it is in this sense that one must understand our thesis that the own being of entities is unreal. So, <laughs> to clarify a little bit, if the dharmas are not ultimate facts, this leads us to a vision of experience that is in constant causal flux. We're experiencing constant change, and this means that none of the entities we are interacting with are static, which is a necessary condition for them to be real in an absolute sense. In other words, they must always be existent to be absolutely real. To maintain emptiness as an ultimate truth, we must accept that its constituents would be equally empty, and thus we have a negation of pluralistic own being, as Chandrakirti puts it, and the dharmas are non-existent. The second way of looking at this, I think, is a little clearer, which is that dharmas have a purely nominal existence. And this is to say that the dharmas are merely words or concepts. Sure, we speak about them and use them to understand our experience, but this is the extent of their existence. The Prajnaparamita Sutra in 100,000 lines says, quote, The dharmas on which beings seek a false support are names and signs. They are not. They are imagined, artificial, adventitious designations, which are added on to what is really there. And Kanzi in his paper paraphrases this sutra and the uh, Prajnaparamita Sutra in 8,000 lines to give us the following explanation. The dharmas are mere words, and words are merely artificial constructions which do not represent dharma, in this case truth with a capital T, so capital T dharma, but which constitute adventitious designations which are imagined and unreal. A bodhisattva does not expect to find any realities behind those words, and in consequence, he does not settle down in them. The dharmas themselves are inexpressible. One cannot properly express the emptiness of all dharmas in words. And additionally, the Prajnaparamita Sutra in 700 lines says, the Buddha is the same as speechless silence. The next point, the dharmas are without marks, with one mark only, i.e. with no mark. And that's how Hanzi explains it, so I left it in quotes because he said this in a very specific way. We spoke last month about this notion of dharmas having marks, and a mark is simply a characteristic of something. The dharmas were special in that each one has one mark, making them atomic units of experience. This is the whole reason analysis in terms of dharmas was supposed to get us to ultimate facts in the first place. But now we have a problem. The dharmas themselves share a single mark, that of emptiness. Thus, no dharma can actually be differentiated from any other in a meaningful way. In the Prajnaparamita Sutra in 25,000 lines, Shariputra is speaking to Subhuti and he asks, what then is the own being of form, etc., for the five skandhas? And Subhuti answers, non-existence is the own being of form and all the others. It is in this sense that form is lacking in the own being of form, and so with the other skandhas. Moreover, form is lacking in the mark, which is characteristic of form. The mark, again, is lacking in the own being of a mark. The own being, again, is lacking in the mark of being own being. Are we lost? No. <laughs> okay. It works. Yeah. <laughs> this is intentional. Kanzi notes, Kanzi notes that this sort of exchange is characteristic of perfection of wisdom sutras, and I certainly would not disagree. What we see is that own being itself is empty, and thus all the superstructure built upon it is being constructed out of that emptiness. It is like trying to construct a building on top of an imaginary foundation. The absence of marks is, is expressed formulaically by saying that, quote, dharmas are not conjoined nor disjoined, immaterial, invisible, 
non-resisting, with one mark only, i.e. no mark. And Kanzi cites this formula from eight locations in Prajnaparamita texts, and that, he says, is a non-exhaustive list. <coughs> the next point is a little more difficult, I think. Which is this no shirt? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> At this point, he says that the dharmas are isolated, and then says absolutely isolated. And I found this one a little bit confusing at first, but I did some battle with it since I first read this article a couple of years ago, and I think maybe now I'll give it a shot. So this perspective is particularly opaque. So I'm going to first quote Kanzi's explanation. In the sutras, this term is treated as a familiar synonym of empty, and nowhere explained. A dharma is called empty when one considers that it has no properties, isolated when one considers that it has no relations to other dharmas. As isolated, dharmas cannot act on each other, and therefore, they are not made or produced. And Kanzi mentions that this is not explained in the text, but we should understand the inability of dharmas being able to act on each other, their isolation, as a consequence of emptiness. How can emptiness act on, or be in any way related to, itself? A relation is generally understood as a logical or natural association between two or more things, uh, relevance of one thing to another, or some sort of connection. This is at least according to the American Heritage Dictionary. If we have undifferentiated emptiness as an ultimate fact, there is only one thing, that being emptiness in this case, and by definition, the idea of a relation is incoherent. I hope that suffices for now. Um, for the next point, uh, dharmas have never been produced, never come into existence, they are never really brought forth, they are unborn, they, are, they have never left the original emptiness. This perspective <laughs> most likely sounds familiar, and similar ideas can be found in several Prajnaparamita texts. To understand the rationale behind this claim, the Satipatthana Sutra, in which the arising of dharmas was an object of... Sorry, to understand the rationale behind this claim, we should look to our <coughs> earlier example of the Satipatthana Sutra, in which the arising of dharmas was an object of contemplation. For the Sarvastivadin school, becoming an arhat, which is sort of the highest level of attainment following the Pali Canon, becoming arhat consisted of uh, the cognition of extinction followed by the cognition of non-production. And the term non-production had been understood to mean that the arhat would no longer produce defilements or unwholesome dharmas after awakening. The Prajnaparamita texts are elevating this to a metaphysical claim and putting a new spin on this idea, saying that if one were truly awakened, there would be no production of any dharmas at all, regardless. Quoting Kanzi, quote, even before enlightenment is reached, one of the most distinctive virtues of the Mahayanistic saint, we could say Bodhisattva, is the, quote, patient acceptance of dharmas which fail to be produced. The last is the similes explaining non-production. So the final way we can understand the ontological status of dharmas in the Perfection of Wisdom text is through similes. The Prajnaparamita Sutra in 8,000 lines lists six similes, stating that the dharmas are like dreams, magical illusions, echoes, reflected images, mirages, and space. Uh, then there is a longer list in the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra in 100,000 lines that gives ten, adding to those first six the moon reflected in water, a village of the Gandharvas, a shadow, and a magical creation, or nirmana. And the Gandharvas, for those who don't know, are sort of beings that exist in the, in the Buddhist cosmology. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but they sort of are seen as magical beings that are in, like, flying cities, so. Flying cities? What? Yeah. That's cool. Like deities? It's not really deities. It's kind of, yeah, yeah. it's... They're, they're more... Um, Residence. Spiritual beings. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's hard to sort of pin them into right. the deity category, I think. Uh, so, in, in the last one, magical creation, the term, that, the term that he's translating here is nirmana. So an interesting side note is that uh, we might actually recognize the term nirmana from the term nirmanakaya, or the reward body, which is one of the three bodies of the Buddha. 
And the reward body is sort of the idealized body of the Buddha that displays all of the merits of Shakyamuni's, Shakyamuni's practice throughout his many lifetimes, culminating in his Buddhahood. And it's kind of interesting because it's apparitional in the sense that this wasn't the historical Buddha's physical body, nor is it sort of the formless Dharma body of our understanding of the teachings and the truth. Uh, it's sort of this, this in-between state where we have an idealized vision of a Buddha that, whose physiognomy has marks that display all of his past deeds. I just thought that was an interesting connection. It's probably not too helpful. <laughs> So these six, perfect, these six perspectives on the ontological status of dharmas are fun to look at, hopefully, but mostly of interest to people who want to explore the nuances of Buddhist philosophy. However, having at least a passing understanding of them demystifies key ideas found in other Mahayana texts. Possibly of more direct interest to us is the psychological attitudes that should result from this new understanding of dharmas. Right, please. So the psychological attitudes begin with uh, the attitude of non-apprehension. And non-apprehension comes as a consequence of the first claim, namely that dharmas are non-existent non -existent in the sense that they are not ultimate, ultimately real. If we're spending a lot of time and energy directing cognitive activity toward apprehending these non-existent dharmas, we're making a critical error. Trying to apprehend a large number of separate entities that have no basis in fact is pushing us farther from reality instead of closer to it. You could say that we're not only jousting in windmills, we're also building windmill, windmills, thinking that we are creating giants. Statements about non-apprehension are so ubiquitous that Kanzi leaves the discussion here after reminding the reader that the Prajnaparamita texts extend this attitude of non-apprehension to emptiness itself. That is to say, we should not try to turn emptiness into a new super concept that conveniently replaces the other dharmas. Emotional concomitants of non-apprehension are summed up in this Sanskrit term, anabhinivesha, which I will not try to say again, <laughs> which Kanzi render, renders as no settling down, which we saw referenced in one of those earlier Prajnaparamita quotes. And for those, uh, Kanzi uses the term concomitance, which occurs a lot in Abhidharma texts and elsewhere, so I left it in here, but that means that it's something that occurs with something else. So this is sort of the emotional part of this change in attitudes. And uh, anabhinivesha, no settling down, has a threefold meaning. There should be no convictions that the, that the dharmas have reality. There should be no inclination toward dharmas. And there should be no attachment to dharmas. These ideas follow directly from the earlier point that dharmas are isolated, combined with the claim that dharmas are non-existent. If one of the two one of these two things in a relation does not exist. Establishing a relation, as we've established, doesn't make much sense. The next attitude of no attainment. We can approach this attitude from two different directions. The emptiness of the person and the emptiness of dharmas. If there is no substantial person, then there is no one to be achieving or realizing anything in the first place. If the dharmas are empty, no person could possess or acquire them. That is, of course, assuming that we establish the substantial existence of a person to do the acquiring in the first place. So it's a closed loop of not being able to establish any of the things uh, in the relationship necessary for there to be attainment. Next is the attitude of non-relying. And the attitude of non-relying is expressed in many places throughout Prajnaparamita texts and other Mahayana texts. I could describe it, but Kanzi does a much better job than I would in his article by drawing from three different texts. He writes, Dharmas, because they lack in either single or manifold own being, are unworthy of reliance. In consequence, the mind of the Tathagata, or the Buddha, is not supported on anything, and those who wish to emulate him should raise a thought which is not supported anywhere. It is in this practice of the six perfections that one learns to lean on nothing whatever. When one practices giving, that should be done in a spirit of complete, uh, Kanzi uses the term disinterestedness, but maybe we could say uh, something a little less loaded, like a spirit of radical equanimity, maybe. 
And what we mean by this is that one gives without grasping at any ideas concerning the gift, its recipient, or the reward which one may reap for one's generosity. And this same threefold purity should be observed with the other five perfections. And last, we have non-assertion. And this is the final attitude presented. If the individual self has been extinguished, it would, be in no, it would in no way be asserted by the practitioner. If the practitioner no longer believes in the existence of a plurality of separate things, none of those things would be asserted. This point is key to understanding why the logical arguments surrounding the perfection of wisdom text can be so confusing. First, asserting things in the first place is no longer a valid option. We are essentially making claims about things as if they exist when we know good and well that they don't. Thus, the treatment of logic must be adapted to the attitudes and perspectives that we've examined so far in the presentation. Next slide, please. And so the following three points of view uh, deal with issues that come from the interrogation of non-duality. And this is the part I put in just for Chip. <laughs> Duality is something we talk about often at TBI. <laughs> the Prajnaparamita Sutra in 25,000 lines says, quote, those who course in duality cannot grow in merit. All the foolish common people are supported by duality and their merit cannot grow. But a bodhisattva courses in non-duality. Hansi explains it as follows. Buddhism says in, sees in ignorance of the facts of life the root of all evil, and the traditional formula of conditioned co-production, what we call dependent origination, shows how the whole world of suffering arises from ignorance as its starting point. The Prajnaparamita now claims that discrimination is the core of ignorance, and that the empirical world with its attendant sufferings is a thought construction derived from false discrimination. End quote. Thus, we might not find it surprising to hear that the Ashta Sahasraka, which I thought I had put a note here, but I'm pretty sure that's the Prajnaparamita Sutra in many lines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I lost my place for a second when I went back to the other page. Uh, thus, we might not find it Surprising to hear that the Ashta Sahasraka says, the Tathagata is one who has forsaken all discoursings and discriminations. But based on the ground that we've covered so far, we have established a sense that the dharmas are non-different, which relies on negation. Kanzi identifies a few places where the Sanskrit sama is used, which he glosses as the English word same. This term is used infrequently in the text and is not developed or explained. Similarly, similarly the term Tathata, which we find in Tathagata, or suchness, is often paired with it. However, the texts overwhelmingly use negation to express their ideas. Considering that the attitude of non-assertion was posited as the attitude of an awakened being, this shouldn't be too surprising. Here, Kanzi examines non-duality from three perspectives. The first one is the duality of subject and object. And this duality can be seen in the separation between the senses and their objects, the separation of the mind and mental objects, or the dharmas, and being awakened or not awakened. While these can be posited conventionally, their separation is incoherent because of the ultimate fact of their emptiness, which renders them undifferentiable. Next, he looks at affirmation and negation. And when we begin to interrogate existence and non-existence from the perspective of the absolute, it is an ultimate fact that they are no longer two separate things. And this puts us in a situation where, despite the experience of provisional existence and non-existence, the underlying reality is that there is no real distinction. The Perfection of Wisdom texts explicitly claim the identities of, the identities of dharmas with their opposites all over the place without making any attempt to resolve the paradoxes presented. The Ashta Sahasraka says that essential nature is no nature. The Shatta Sahasraka says that practice is no practice, and also that the absolute thought that one should aspire to is no thought. No thought is further, further qualified there. And I quote, that thought which is no thought is not something which is, because one cannot find in it either a there is or a there is not. End quote. <laughs> the Sapta Sahasraka identifies the self, previously shown to be illusory, deceptive, and undesirable, <clears throat> and identified with ignorance, and then takes that and identifies it with both the perfection of wisdom and the Tathagata. 
The Diamond Sutra should come to mind as well as a relatively accessible sutra that follows this pattern extensively and which Kanzi describes as making a point of observation that each one of the leading concepts of Buddhist theory is equivalent to its contradictory opposite. For those not familiar with the text, the Diamond Sutra repeat, repeatedly uses the formulation X is not X, therefore it is called X. Many pages of this. <laughs> and presents a sort of catechism in which foundational Buddhist ideas are identified as their opposites and as mere verbal designations. The last part about the, the duality of the condition and the unconditioned is uh, sort of interesting. So, based on the discussion so far, you may have noticed that applying logical reasoning from a perspective informed by the emptiness of dharma seems to turn logic on its head. We cannot seem to make claims that are consistent between our mundane experience and an absolute reality behind it, or beyond it, I mean. Kanzi identifies the issue as being that our traditional logic is adapted to a world of relatives, but now this same tool is being used to consider relations between the relative or conventional and the absolute, the conditioned and the unconditioned, or samsara and nirvana. You probably see where this is going. At the level of the absolute, we already established that relations are impossible because there is nothing to relate to, and now we are trying to relate the unrelatable to the provisional world, which is characterized as completely relative. Now we are trying to posit absolute relations, which, based on our understanding of the absolute, are not possible. An issue that arises is that we can posit an absolute identity, like nirvana is samsara, which we've seen in Buddhist sutras. And this implies that there are absolute identities. There should be, uh, that if there are absolute identities, there should be absolute differences as well. Despite being stated differently, they turn out to be equivalent. Kanzi writes, and here's another mind bender for you, please enjoy. Yes. Nirvana and I are absolutely different. I cannot get it, and it cannot get me. I can never find it, because I am no longer there when it is found. It cannot find me, because I am not there to be found. But Nirvana, the everlasting, is there all the time. The Ashta Sahasrika says, suchness is everywhere the same, since all dharmas have already attained nirvana. What keeps me apart from it now in me? Nothing real at all, since the self is a mere invention. So <coughs> now, in truth, there is no real difference at all between me and nirvana. The two are identical. Boom. End quote. <laughs> Slide, please. <laughs> Okay, I hope that was all very confusing. So, <laughs> here's where we were going. And we don't have a lot of time to do it. Yes. <laughs> so many of the claims that we've been making so far are very confusing, and I don't recommend that you sort of take these and try to apply them in ways like saying, you know, food is not food, eating is not eating, these sort of practical things. That's not really the point. The point of these texts is that practitioners spent a lot of time trying to develop texts that spent a lot of time creating the experience that they believed an awakened bodhisattva would have of the world. And because of this, part of the intent of using these texts is that we should continue to practice the foundational Buddhist practices, but we should have the perspective of the Prajnaparamita in mind as we do so. And that's basically what Nagarjuna says very clearly as one of the major articulators of Madhyamaka philosophy. Now, if that doesn't sound practical enough, uh, then I would like to also say that at the end of it, if you really want to know how to practice it, we should return to the beginning of this and say that our primary practice is not to do evil, to cultivate merit, to purify one's mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. Thank you. I'm sorry that was very long. <laughs> that was the fastest I could have gone to that conclusion.